I also, today I'm presenting um, the work of Jean Dixon. She was an astrologer from the um, 60s and 50s who made, she was also a psychic and she made some pretty bold predictions, especially in relationship to 1962. Um, now, in 1962, and Jean Dixon herself was brought to my attention uh, through Jason Brashear's The Chronicon, which is uh, a, well, looks like a very, very complete chronology of the ancient and modern world. This is a chronology that starts with 5239 BC all the way up to 2106 BC. The way that Brashears looks at history is as he looks at it as palindromic, meaning whatever's happened in the past will repeat in the future. And uh, this also coincides with the work of Sovereign Key La de Leon, who talks about the return of the ancients during end times. Uh, Jason touches on this as well. And so I will be interpreting the charts of 1962 of the precise dates, the chart, the chart itself that Gene Dixon came up with, as well as Gene Dixon's astrology and human design charts, and also look at it through the human design, the um, the 1962 chart. Also, I will be um, nuancing this information, or these charts with, or this understanding today with the work of both Rudolf Steiner and uh, Jason Brashears, who I mentioned of Archaics and his Chronicon. Now I'm going to start by giving background um, by reading some of the passages from the Chronicon to give you guys some context to understand the claim of Jean Dixon. Her claim was that many, uh, many terrible, many interesting things and dark things occurred in 1962. Jason actually has uh, the most uh, kind of evidence for this in the sense because he relates it to his chronology. He relates it to um, a deal made um, that in essence is repeating itself in 1962, but that occurred in 3439 BCE, according to his chronicon. And I'll read that here. Uh, his claim is that in 3439 BC, uh, Anunnaki, aka the Watchers, descended to earth to teach mankind before the flood the forbidden knowledge they bestowed in exchange. They bestowed in exchange for human females. Now, if you know his work, you know that he's talking about uh, the Anunnaki in terms of the Sumerian beings who fled from the Americas to to Europe and Asian lands. He's not talking about beings that descended from space or UFOs. He's not talking about that. And he said now, what he said was now in 1962, history repeats itself. And the elites of the military industrial complex and corporate giants allied with the Anunnaki, giving them permission to abduct human females for genetic experimentation. And, uh, Certainly, there's some evidence to back this up uh, from many different quarters. Um, one note is that that, well, I'll just go over everything that occurred that year or all the interesting things that occurred. I think one thing he mentioned in his video on, um, I think it's the Gate of Syak, uh, Isaac, Isaac, I can't remember, but it's one of, um, but it's that video or it's the Dark Satellite, two of the videos on Jason's website, the dark satellite, referring to um, beings that were trapped. Oh, I forgot to go over that, actually. So if we go back to the original deal, um, there's something that occurred around that time later where, uh, and this is noted in the Book of Enoch, that some beings were trapped for 600 years. And after the 600 years is 1962. So another interesting incident. Now, some of the things that occurred in 1962, there was a there was a, um, a comet that had a weird plas plasma tail and um, that that was far away from the sun. And it was noticed as being very turbulent and having effects on, um, on our biosphere. 
a lot of magnetic field disturbances and <clears throat> affecting many satellites as well. Uh, also, the ultra-secret Cheyenne Mountain Complex was completed near Colorado Springs. This is a massive underground facility with tunnel systems leading to other underground bases and cities. This information was released in the UFO community uh, um, in terms of Dulce, New Mexico, when there was supposedly a battle between humans and aliens. I mean, all it all sounds pretty absurd now. <laughs> it really does. Um, but this... This it was all it was connected to revealing such information about there being underground cities being made. Also, I think this year, 1962, was discovered in Anatolia, Turkey, that there were many, many cities underground. And they've been continuing to discover more and more cities. And this is starting to become clear that there are many, many um cities and um populations underground. It's a, it's a kind of strange and scary thought. Um, reminds me of some incident where there were men underground and they heard screams from deep below. It was like some kind of hell realm where people were screaming. Can you remember the reference to that? Um, what else? So the deal uh, that was made was related to uh, another piece of interesting evidence, whereas the global phenomenon of close encounters of the fourth kind, abductions of unwilling humans for experimentation and fetal extractions and planning of tracking devices, supposedly occurred in 1962. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, there's reference to this in movies, films, but it's always with some kind of, um, and even David Icke said this, um, although I don't, I mean, it was, what was said was that they're, they have some kind of technology that makes them look other than they are. Um, in terms of David Icke, he was saying that it makes them look human as opposed to the reptilians that they are. But I think uh, the opposite is the case, that it's technology that makes them look like alien instead of the humans that they are. That makes sense. That That kind of makes more sense to me as it's turned out that the UFO communities, the... Um, all these, many of these writers are all, uh, it seems to be agents for alphabet agencies um, spreading an agenda of things being out there instead of below us or um, within the earth, which seems to be to make more sense with all the evidence found. Uh, the chart I'm going to do speaks to this massive conjunction of planets that occurred in February 5th, 1962. This is what the astrologer Gene Dixon referenced and created the chart for. There was also some speculation about Venus being like an intruder planet because of some strange things it was doing. It was retrograding on its axis, uh, rotating on its axis in a retrograde motion, to be precise. And Velikovsky had already said this. Of course, Velikovsky was maligned by his scientific peers and there's other references here 1962 being the 60th year of the great pyramids giza's course countdown to armageddon in 2106 plus it's also 60 years after 1902 which is the last phoenix reset um, from the synthesis of jason brashear's work and there's another reference to 144 years after 1962. That's 2106 CE. So 144 years after 1962 is the end of this construct, is, is what Jason has said. Uh, let's see. It talks about these beings masquerading as like uh, extra dimensional extraterrestrials. Uh, the reference was made to the Book of Enoch of imprisoned um, beings. Uh, and this reference is also from the book of um, The Light of Egypt by Thomas Bergon, where he has a chapter on uh, the dark satellite, which are these beings that um, almost like a planetary body come close to the earth. Every certain amount of years, 
and uh, it affects humanity negatively. And to get an idea of what this like almost impossible concept to conceive of um, may appear is is there he's he's referenced it as like the, the scene in Superman near the end of the Superman film where the three beings who are all dressed in black, the negative beings are all like somehow put into some kind of device some kind of like a square like device and they're spinning throughout space and they're and you see them like trapped and like in panic and uh it's a fascinating idea and so that's supposed to be it's supposed to be kind of the idea of of these beings being trapped and then released apparently so 1962 is when they were released hence the birth of a great evil that Jean Dixon was knowingly or unknowingly referring to. What she specifies is that in 1962, uh, an Antichrist was born. So she's referencing another aspect of that year. Um, but the part that Jason references is the release of all these entities into the world in 1962 and, and, and the slow encroachment of misdirected uh, moralism and most like a de-evolutionary jump of mankind. Uh, of course, this is not added here, but um, the devolution that is modern digital technology probably was beginning to make leaps and bounds um, around around this time. I think IBM was prior though, and of course computers themselves were more of the seventies. But it's it's all kind of forming at this time. I'm going to go now to, let's see, I'm going to stop share this. Let me go to another chart. I'm going to go to Jean Dixon's chart. Not her chart, but I'm just going to do a summary of an article by Robert Powell. So this is an article on Jean, on Jean Dixon's prophecy. Now there's some reference here to um, Rudolf Steiner that I wanted to get over. Now Steiner was religious, so he gives credence to the freight to the number 666 which uh, um, Jason says says was created by the church now this number sequence according to Steiner is related to the numerical value in Hebrew of the sun demon called Sora and so he he actually predicts the year 1998. Uh, which is formed by three times 666. And so his idea is that an Antichrist will be bo was born in 1998, which is the year of the tiger. And um, I haven't yet looked at the charts for that year to see if I see any interesting um, stelliums of power. Um, the 1962 chart, which I'll go over, has... Uh, very interesting seven planet stellium in um, in the Placidus. It's in um, Aquarius. In the sidereal chart, it is in Capricorn. And I'll, I'll talk about that. I just wanted to go over this really quickly. And let's see. Yeah, she goes over, or this this guy goes over how um, in the sidereal chart. Um, oh, and at the same time, five hours after this um, alignment in February 5th, 1962, at around seven in the morning, five hours later, there was going to be a total eclipse of the sun. Now, this is fascinating because in astrology, an eclipse of the sun is symbolic of a black sun reigning over our sky. And the natives always said that during a um, solar eclipse, it is best to hide oneself from the shame of the sun. So in other words, in, in affecting that, there's some kind of curse that's made on humanity. If humanity is, is exposed to the rays of that black sun imagery and, um, this is really fascinating as, as eclipses always her herald, um, you know, very extreme changes. Uh, and, you know, when an eclipse happens on our personal sun and our chart, it affects, it affects us in transit. 
um, there was an eclipse, for example, where Scorpio was, it was actually, the eclipse was opposed to the sun in Scorpio. And this was in November, October of last year. And so all my Scorpio um, friends and family, I let them know, and I kind of just observed it for them to see what the secret, what, what the, um, what the plan was, how to move with that energy. And at some point I figured it out and I mentioned it to them, um, but I didn't figure it out right away. Uh, and that makes sense, which with eclipses, the sun is being, um, it's being clouded. Uh, you know, that's the life force being clouded by, by darkness. And, um, and yeah, so it's real interesting. So I don't want to get into that now. So there's some reference here. This is interesting to, um, to these planets, uh, seven. So it's a seven planet stellium in uh, the sign of Capricorn, conjuncting the moon's node also in Capricorn. I think that's a north node. And um, there's some reference here to it being a sort of imperial horoscope according to the Roman astrologers, uh, because it's in, pro because anytime there's two or more planets in proximity to the ascendant, it gives a lot of power. And so I think that's the last reference. I'm going to go to the charts. This is the first chart. This is the chart in the article. And this is the sidereal chart. And so sidereal, the difference between sidereal astrology charts is they're based on the constellations. As you see here, it's a very interesting chart because uh, the correspondences between the sign and the constellations is actually shown. Real interesting. And so there you see on the ascendant, which is here on the left-hand side middle, this is an ascendant here in Capricorn. You see the symbol there? And all these planets, though they seem like they're um, on top of each other all the way down, the uh, the markers, the lines here point to one area. So they're all around 21, 23, 24 degrees. So they're tight, tightly linked together. Uh, what's, was, what I found really interesting was that all those um, planets are square Neptune. Now, Neptune is in itself symbolic of... It's not a visible planet, so it's about hidden things, right? Anytime, any planets beyond the classical seven connote that which is hidden from us. These are the trans-Neptunian um, planets. That's Neptune, Pluto, and Uranus. We can't see them with the naked eye. Uh, thus, they rule uh, things that we ourselves can't see about our own actions, which is compulsions and obsessions and... Um, delusions. So Neptune rules delusion and also rules spiritual sight. But in this case, it's square. I mean, and just being square, every single personal planet here uh, is just every form of deception can be accounted for, especially at being in square and inner tension. So this is so interesting. It's like, this is someone, if, if, if indeed this is someone that was born at that time, this is someone with a great confluence of strength and power. Another way, let me see, I'm going to look at some of my notes on this. What I noted is it's a super stellium cluster of seven planets combined to act as one force. And scoring Neptune, this is a deceptive um, force or intent. And... Um, of course, it being close to a solar eclipse speaks almost literally of the intent to, to kind of blacken out the sun, not in a, not in the sense of the phoenix. The phoenix also has that symbolism, but phoenix is not represented in a negative sense, except maybe symbolically. But this is more, this is literally a total eclipse. So um, really fascinating. And it's the south node. That's actually um, in Capricorn conjuncting all these planets, the North Node being in Cancer. Now, this is another significant marker because the journey of the North Node to the South Node in this chart is actually from death to rebirth. Um, spirits um, supposedly 
arrive, according to Santos Bonacci's work, they arrive on the tropic of cancer and upon death leave on the tropic of Capricorn. So here we have the reverse. Um, very interesting. And so this is the chart. Let me see if I have any other insights to add. I wanted to also note the elements here. We're dealing with um, all the planets, all the seven classical planets in the south node and Earth, in Earth, inside of the Earth, squaring Neptune in Libra, which is ruled by Venus. Now, Venus is very interesting. I'll be going to that in another video. But um, there was a lot of tribute given to Venus. Venus rules Friday. And Friday ruled the day of, of um, of, I'm forgetting the term, but it ruled, at least symbolically, uh, it ruled death. Um, it was the day, I think, that, I think religiously, that they used the metaphor of when Christ was put up on the cross, if I'm remembering correctly, and also was celebrated by the natives as a day of execution. That's what I was getting at, or sacrifice. So sacrifice is made to Venus. So that's... Um, very interesting. Neptune in itself rules sacrificial energy, being very, um, being the ruler of Pisces. And also in this chart, uh, let's see, Pluto and Uranus is in the sign of, oh, I can't, that's so interesting the way these symbols are. Though so they're, they're both in Leo which is another layered nuance of the death of the sun. The ruler of Leo is the sun. And we have Pluto, the underworld sun, in the house that rules the sun. And we have Uranus there as well. Fascinating layers of meaning here. So now I'm going to go to another chart. Let's see what else I have here. Wait, um, I'm going to go to the Placidus chart of this, and maybe oh, also so let me do the sidereal first. So, so many charts to go through. So this is this is just my version of the sidereal chart. It's much easier to understand. The other one was. It's a really old, interesting chart with the constellations, though. So here you see all these planets more clearly. You see them in Capricorn on the Ascendant. Uh, this is, and it's right there on the Ascendant, maybe two, three degrees off the Ascendant. So what would I say the ruling planet of this chart is? <laughs> I mean, Saturn rules Capricorn. So Saturn definitely is... And Saturn is in is nine degrees. So Mars and Saturn are conjunct here. And the rest of the planets are more in the 22, 23, 24 degree area. So actually, it looks like Saturn and Mars are not exactly conjunct, but it's, they're all in Capricorn in, um, in the sidereal chart. Let me go ahead now to the Placidus chart. I wanted to do the Placidus chart because I'm more or just my preference to do Placidus, so I usually do those charts. Where is it? Second. Oh, I have modern transits on it. Um, so this is the chart, um, and this is the specific date and place that Gene Dixon decided Tobruk, Libya. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. And 7.20 a.m. And you see in the Placidus charts, all the planets, all the seven classical planets are in Aquarius. 
now in this chart, well, I should say Aquarius is still very much the ruler. Saturn is still very much the ruler of Aquarius, at least classically. The modern ruler, people say Uranus, you know, some, some astrologers say Uranus. Um, you know, the, the classical interpretation was is interesting here because again it's still Saturn rulership. We can look at it that way. If we look at it, Uranus rulership, Uranus is in the seventh in Leo. Oh, and, and it looks like Pluto's in Virgo in this chart as well, instead of being in Leo. And also in this one, the North Node is in Leo, which is rule, which is, is the territory of the sun. So we have the North Node here in this chart being the direction of the sun, and the South Node being Aquarius, where all the planets are conjunct in Aquarius and the ruler being Saturn or Uranus. This almost this if you look at this, the dichotomy or the the flip between the first and seventh house looks like some sort of battle taking place. And we could see this in the prior chart as well, as if this is this birth is symbolic of some type of battle. But, uh, with mankind. Now, one thing that was interesting, I forgot to go over in the article about Gene Dixon, is there was some talk about um, Rudolf Steiner's terms called crossing of the threshold. Now, this is really interesting because this is the idea that um, humanity, that, that the Antichrist rather, represents the negative karma of humanity. So it rep re represents the double of the Christ. So like a double created of humanity where we have to deal with what we've created and come to terms with that and clear it or whatever. The karmic idea that Steiner had was, it's interesting to me, at least in the notes that I take, that I've taken, that this can be also seen on an individual level in the sense of an individual walking or crossing through his own threshold um, and getting a sight of his own double. Now, of course, this happens in Star Wars with Luke Skywalker seeing, you know, um, in the Dagobah system when he goes into the cave, right? And he encounters Darth Vader. And, and um, prior to going in, um, he said something, Yoda said something to him like, um, or he asked, do I need to take my weapon? And he says, only take what? Oh, I forgot. That was a great quote, though. Um, but it was something like, you only need what you... Ah, oh, forget it. Um, so, but anyway, getting back to this theme, um, the theme of the double, it's, it's, it's rampant in literature. Um, there's just so many books, so much literature. My favorites being Nathaniel Hawthorne's Young Goodman Brown, where uh, the character explores the night and sees everyone who he sees during the day in the forest with the devil and then wakes in the morning to see the whole world anew in a different way. And, of course, probably the best example is Edgar Allan Poe's Will I Am, Will Son, where the whole setup of the story is actually the creation of his own double will willing his own separate kind of birth of being right will we'll start with the, the first name william which is will i am and then will son um the double being his son and of course in that story um the character is um throughout the whole story there's a shadow uh, just behind him, attempting to keep up with him and, and trap him for everything that the shadow is doing, as if he's hiding his own deeds or negative deeds from himself. And of course, that culminates in the end with a battle between the double and the self, which is what Steiner, I think, is getting at in terms of us accumulating karma over a lifetime and that karma accumulating into our shadow, into that double. And if we don't do the shadow work, then um, we've separated ourselves from those misdeeds or what we've done that, that that we deny we deny doing. And anyway, it's interesting ideas from Steiner, and I really liked it because it coincided with the theme of the double. 
um, both on a microcosmic level and a macrocosmic in terms of humanity. So real interesting stuff. Anyway, that has nothing to do with this particular chart, so I'll go to the next. Next one I'm going to do is, let's see if I can find the human design chart that I did for, I don't think, did I do it for 1962? I'm sure I did. Let's see. Yes, I did. Okay, great. Okay, so this is the human design chart for 1962, February 5th, around 7.20 a.m. in Libya. This is the birth of the Antichrist human design graph imagery. We have a generator 3.5. I'm not trying to knock generators. <laughs> it's just what it is. <laughs> and I mean, whether it, what it is or not, we don't know. This is, this is very speculative. <laughs> Unless we at some point see evidence of this. So what 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 hits me right away, and everyone you know might be different for those familiar with human design, but what hits me right away is again the markers of death. Uh, and that usually begins with the beat, the beat channel, which is one or the heartbeat two, channel two fourteen, this is unconscious. And we can see this on the, in the middle of the G center, very individuated channel, all the way down to the sacral, the 14. And this is someone with the capacity to um, see the right direction and, um, and can motivate others to follow it through their own example. So this is like a leadership energy, and it's also success at a material level. So it's bringing, you know, with great, life force energy it's, it's materializing um life force energy into the world and maybe this could also be the wrong direction <laughs> now what what makes it not too different from the phoenix chart is that um it portends death by way of the direction of the 214 down and out of the body uh which would which added to it would be the 360. But here we only have gate 60 activated, not the three. Gate three is not activated here. Now, will there be transits that year that will activate gate three? Um, yes, there will be. And uh, not long after, if I'm correct, that's in Aries gate. So that'll be a couple months later during that year that that was activated. And um, the eclipse would have been on gate 13. So that's going to be up here in the G center. So this is um, really interesting. A lot of open centers here. And uh, the channel that's activated is a very individuated channel, the 214 unconscious. We have 3-5, which, uh, you know, the, the third line beings, they experience life head on. Um, there's a lot of trial and error with third lines. And then the fifth line is the projection field. You know, uh, even in this chart, this being cannot be seen clearly. Um, you know, the projection field gets in the way of the fifth line. You see any other interesting things? Pluto is in gate 40. Um, that's the gate of community. That's the gate of the family of humanity. Perhaps that's the death signature here. Pluto symbolizing purification and death in gate 40, uh, line 4 and line 5. Another interesting component. Um, you see Saturn's in 41 and 61. Um, Saturn is where we're punished when we don't follow our personal law. Our personal law being Jupiter, gate 60 and gate... 13. Gate 13 is about listening. And gate 60 is um, another, as I already noted, the signature of, well, gate uh, of, of, of death in terms of it being missing that one gate and, and sending energy straight out of the body. Um, 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that directly in terms of its gain. Um, I think that's all I'll say for that chart. Finally, let me get to Gene Dixon's two charts. So this is Gene's astrology chart. I think I have this in Placidus. Yes. So Gemini Ascendant. Um, I was looking at the aspects. Um, nothing, nothing really stood out too strongly. I'm sure there's a lot in there. I'm just taking a glimpse at this. Uh, the biggest thing that I noticed is uh, Pluto on the Ascendant. Now, Pluto on the Ascendant is a very powerful position. Uh, this is usually early on trauma, an opening of sorts, definitely um, psychic powers uh, can give somebody with their early traumas. And we have Pluto opposing Uranus, which is a very powerful aspect. Uh, it's not that close, though, in orb. I remember checking it. Pluto is at 19 Gemini, and Uranus is at 26 Sag. So 7 degree, not too, not too, not too far either. And North Node in the 5th. Let's see, Moon in the 4th. 10th house, Mars. So, yeah, not much else I'm seeing here, of course, I'm just giving just a basic look, and then I'll finally look at our human design chart. Go ahead and put that up. This is her chart here. This is, um, we have her at January 5th, 1904. And we have her as a manifesting generator, 5-2. Uh, quadruple split definition, uptime cross of individualism, authorities, emotional wave. And she's got a pure manifesting generator chart with the 3420 and um, the power of the 1949 very powerful emotional channel and a mental uh, channel that's good at solving problems for others, not herself, which may make sense with her psychic predictions. And also we have probably the most powerful channel in the chart. She's got the channel of the priestess, the channel of initiation, the 2551. Uh, this is the channel of initiation into other worlds and back. Um, very powerful. She's there utilizing um, her the vision that she had. I feel it's very much a visionary um, channel in the sense of not just being able to go to other worlds and back, but also vi visibly, vi visually, through the inner sight. And so this is her chart. I think I'll leave it at that. And uh, thanks all. If you have questions, concerns, complaints, um, or suggestions, feel free to put it in the chat. As always, I hope you enjoy and um, also subscribe. And, and that's it. Thanks so much.